the world is changing. People's attention spans are getting shorter. So they're always going to want the next best thing, the next best platform. And if you can stick with the times, I think that just adds to the success of what your, your business can be in the future. At Founder, we're leading an educational revolution in training the entrepreneurs of tomorrow. In this series, we're talking to our own students to discover how they're building the businesses of their dreams. These are real everyday people who have made it happen. Now, before we jump in, our lawyers have told us to tell you this. Of course, we can't guarantee you'll have the results like some of our stories we're about to share in the show. And as you know, with any business, it's a lot of hard work in addition to completing any online course. And with that said, welcome to From Zero to Founder. Hey guys, Molly here. I'm the community manager for Founder Magazine and welcome back to the series From Zero to Founder. I'm really excited to sit down with one of our Start and Scale students, Jennifer Abernathy, who is founder of Access Athletics and has made 10K from Kickstarter to help launch her business. I'm really excited to sit down and talk with her today. Welcome, Jennifer. Why not start off and introduce yourself? Sure. My name is Jennifer Abernathy. I'm in Los Angeles, California. And uh, the first business I opened with Start and Scale is called Access Athletics. It is an athletic wear business and it's designed specifically for people who are on the go. It's a line of zip off athletic wear, which is very unique, um, which allows me to stand out from the market. It's zip off leggings, zip off sports bras. I specifically designed it for hot yoga students. And then it kind of evolved into a larger scale clothing line. And I just started another one. I won't go too in-depth with that because I haven't officially launched, but I'm going through the start and scale um, you know, process with that as well. But it just hasn't officially launched. So we can focus on Access Athletics. Amazing. Thank you so much for that little update. I'm very excited because I know uh, it's definitely something that stood out to me because there's nothing worse than trying to take off a sports bra when you're hot and sweaty. So having that zip off is the best thing. And is that something that kind of stood out to you the most when you were creating it? Is some of the problems that you experienced yourself with some of the athletic lines that you were wearing? Yeah, so, you know, I initially designed it for myself. I was being selfish and I had a problem that I was sick of doing, like squeezing out of my sweaty workout gear in a tiny little locker room in this yoga studio, you know? And so I grew up sewing. My mom taught us how to sew. She made all of our Halloween costumes and like, you know, simple dresses and that sort of thing. So I knew how to use a sewing machine. So I created the first sample myself and uh, I started wearing it to hot yoga and everybody was asking me, where'd you get that? I want one. I'll buy one from you. I don't, doesn't matter how it costs, how much it costs. And so I was like, Ooh, I think I have an idea here. Um, so that's kind of where it started. It's a pain point, And they always say you make money by solving as many problems as you possibly can, right? So I decided to kind of jump on the train and that's how I got introduced to you guys and how I got started. I love that. That's really exciting, especially probably having that, I guess, confirmation at the very beginning, knowing that your idea is something that people are actually searching for would have been very inspiring to you. Is that right? Yeah, for sure. I was blown away by the response. I honestly like never in a million years, years thought I would make a business out of it, but all the responses and the requests that I was getting, I was like, I have to do this. I have to try something because like, how do you say no to people that are asking for something that they see that they need, right? Like you just have to do it. <laughs> exactly. I couldn't agree with you more. And prior to, I guess, you even thinking of this idea, what was your day-to-day -day life like? Were you in a corporate job? Were you always an entrepreneur? Walk me through that. Yeah, so Access was my second business that I started. I started an online clothing business a really long time ago and was kind of just, I started that by clothing my friends, you know, and it evolved to, I owned a fashion truck, which if you haven't heard of that, it's basically like a food truck, but for clothes. So I would go around and do all like the night markets and the fairs and that sort of thing. So I was kind of already in the clothing business, um, but I also had a corporate job. So I was in medical sales, medical device sales. The really good thing about medical device sales is that it gives you a lot of autonomy throughout your day. So I could, you know, like book all of my client appointments during the day and then work on my businesses at night or vice versa. You know, it kind of let me do whatever I want. So it was a really perfect position to be in. Um, I actually left that job because Access was having me move to Columbia. That's where I designed the clothing. And so like, I kind of made a life choice. Everything was going so well. And all of the responses that I were getting were 
were so great that I ended up quitting my corporate job before I had officially launched because I had built up such a wait list. And I was like, I know this is going to be successful so I can do this. And worst case scenario is like, I can go back into the medical device world. And luckily I haven't had to do that, but, um, it, it's been an interesting ride, a really cool ride. It sounds like quite the journey, which is amazing. And I think it's also super exciting that you could kind of transition away from maybe your original nine to five into something that you're more passionate about even before launching, which is so exciting. What do you think really stood out to you about, I guess, the start and scale course and founder in particular to help actually make your vision become a reality? Sure. Um, I don't remember how I initially found out about Founder, to be honest with you. I don't know how um, I came to do the research, but once I found out that it was like a step by step, how you get things started to like where we want to try to get you, I was like, this is something that I definitely want to do. And I'm so thankful that I did it because it really does give you the best foundation when you have no idea what you're doing, right? It was easy for me to start my clothing business because that's just like wholesale. You buy it from someone and then you resell it. But when you're starting something from start to finish and you like have to find your own manufacturer, you have to find your audience. You have to create your audience before you find your audience. And you have to do all of the little things that like you don't know what you don't know, right? So founder gives you what you don't know and they set you on a path to be able to succeed and um it just was a wonderful experience to me. I definitely would not have a successful company without you guys. That means so much. Thank you. Honestly, it's really great. I think one of my favorite things about having this podcast and being able to speak to so many students is hearing your stories and hearing how one course can create and impact so many different people. So thank you so much for sharing. But going back to your product and your manufacturing, manufacturing, you mentioned you made the first sample. Is that sample that you first originally made still the basis of what your company is today? Um, yes and no. So right, like I basically took a pair of leggings that I semi liked that I didn't mind ruining and put a zipper down it, right? And like, took a sports bra that I kind of liked, kind of didn't, and put a zipper down the middle and made it look presentable so I didn't look like a crazy person going to yoga class. <laughs> but with me making it myself, there's a lot of technical things that I'm just not able to do that I ended up finding out later. So there's little things like I have a protective layer of um, fabric underneath my zipper so that the zipper never touches your skin. I didn't have that in my original design. I found out the hard way that like nobody wants a zipper on your skin zipping up and down. So I've now fixed that like the zipper never touches your skin. So that was an addition that we made. But in general, it, it sounds different, but it's really basic. It's just a legging with zippers on both sides, right? So you can just get in and out of it easily. Same thing with the sports bra. So uh, basic design in the beginning, but just a little more technical now. Very, very interesting. And how did you go about when you decided to pursue this as an actual brand and your business, how did you actually locate your manufacturers and take that to the next step of having just a sample that you created? Mm -hmm. um, so you have to find somebody to create a tech pack. That's one of the things that you just don't know how to do when you haven't been formally taught to be a designer. So um, in the midst of looking for somebody to create tech packs, you kind of like dig around, you ask a lot of questions. Where do you, where do your customers or clients manufacture their clothes? And you send out a ton, I mean, hundreds of emails crossing your fingers, which like just hoping for somebody to email you back. And in the midst of that storm, um, I actually sent an email to um, somebody that was managing like a liaison, I guess, from like bringing people from the United States to Colombia. And they kind of like gave me the spiel of like why we should work with Colombia and not these other countries. And um, that's how I ended up finding my manufacturer. I ended up going out there to one of their, um, their conferences and I got to meet with like four different manufacturers and I, I chose two and um, picked the wrong one the first time and got it right the second time. <laughs> Interesting. I find that you even mentioning that would be really insightful to probably some people listening because sometimes manufacturing can be the biggest hurdle of all. You might have this great business idea and you just don't know how to execute it. Walk me through some of the learnings that you may have had, I guess, from the beginning with that first manufacturer to actually making you realize that you wanted to swap and pursue a different manufacturer. Yeah, um, it's actually a pretty intense horror story of like starting a business, right? So 
I, um, I launched my business on Kickstarter. So if, for those of the people out there that don't know what Kickstarter is, it's a crowdfunding platform and you basically put your ideas out there. People purchase your product in anticipation of getting it later. Once it's like finally done, they do so at a lower price point so that they can kind of like beat the crowd and get, you know, the new up and coming thing, but at a lower price. So it's a long process. Before I launched on Kickstarter, I went through, you know, the start and scale stuff and built my, um, my, my pre-list, my pre-sale list to a couple hundred people. Actually, I think it was like four or 500 people. And then I launched and then I had a three month Kickstarter. So people that purchased in the beginning, they had to wait the three months for the Kickstarter to be over. And then from then on, I laid out a plan that was another three or four months um, for the clothes to get manufactured, right? Because you don't get the money until your Kickstarter's done. And so I got the money, I paid the manufacturer, we went through the process of doing all the samples and color testing and fabric testing and all of that. And once they told me like, yes, everything's perfect. Once you okay this last design, we're gonna start manufacturing everything. And I was like, this is amazing, I'm on time. Like everything's going exactly as planned. And um, I okayed the last design and um, they kept telling me along the way, like everything's good, everything's working perfectly, your designs look great, we're so excited. And then I want to say 30 days before I was set to ship out the um, purchases to all my customers, I woke up to this long email from the manufacturer that was like, um, we are so sorry, your clothes are taking a lot longer to make than we thought it was, than we thought it would, um, we're going to send you back all of your money. We're not continuing on with your, with your, <laughs> with your line. And I was like, <gasps> Like a month, like 30 days, I'm supposed to be shipping everything out. And along the way, since they're telling me everything's fine, I'm telling my customers everything's fine, right? Because that's all the information that I'm getting. And uh, so that was a disaster. So my customers should have gotten the product three months after the Kickstarter ended, and it ended up taking eight or nine months. Um, so not a lot of happy customers, but there's not a lot that you can do in that situation when your manufacturer is basically lying to you, right? So the lesson I learned there is to just always have two manufacturers that you're working with. Get a sample in the beginning from both. So if something goes wrong with the first one, you at least have somebody on backup. And a lot of times it, samples are expensive. I was doing clothing, so it wasn't that bad to have two samples. You know, some people are doing like bigger projects where samples are like thousands of dollars. Um, so people may not be able to do it all the time, but I highly, highly recommend at least having like some sort of backup that you've already spoken to, that you have contact information for, that you've gotten pricing from, because um, if not, you'll be in one of those situations with a lot of unhappy customers and no sleep and stress. <laughs> Definitely a learning experience, that's for sure. And I think it's great that you had such resilience to just keep on going because I'm sure a lot of people might have been deterred by that sort of situation. And for you to get back up there and try and find someone else that can help you execute the idea, I think is really, really inspirational. And I'm sure a lot of people listening will agree. So when you found your second manufacturer, what was the process like from there? You had already these designs and samples. Did you continue with the same ones or design again? So uh, I had to change the design just a tiny, tiny bit because uh, they had different types of machines that like couldn't go through the, the depth of the zipper or they couldn't go through the depths of the folds that we were doing. So it changed just a little bit, but only to fit their manufacturing machines, right? So the design was basically the same. Um, the clothes were a little more expensive the second time around, but at that point I didn't have a choice, you know? Um, so that was fine, but they moved very quickly. They loved the product. They were able to do any changes that we needed in the future. And they're great. I, I work with them still now. Um, just an amazing process with the second round. I wish I would have chosen them the first round. <laughs> Everything's in hindsight, isn't it? For sure. I, um, I think that's really inspirational because, you know, like I mentioned before, a lot of people would quit and now you've got something better that you're still having an ongoing relationship with that manufacturer, which is amazing. Uh, you mentioned before your launch, you actually managed to get quite a lot of people on your email list. Did you want to talk me through how you actually obtained or even gained hype around your product besides or with Kickstarter? Yeah, absolutely. And this is, you know, a process that I pulled straight from start and scale. I wouldn't have known about it without it, you know. So um, I did a contest, which is what got me my first couple hundred followers slash purchases 
slash people on my wait list, whatever you want to call it. But um, it was kind of like a round robin situation, right? So you do it on um, Facebook, Instagram, um, what other platforms were out there, email, and you can even text people as well. So basically, you set up a contest for your followers that says, um, each of these things that you do, meaning you like a post, you forward a post, you, um, you know, get somebody else to sign up. It's a, it's a certain level of points that you get. And so the higher you go up on the list, maybe your prize is like a free pant when it comes out or a free sports bra or a free water bottle, whatever it is. And so people wanted to win this, you know, new really cool zip off legging so badly that like I was getting one person forwarding it to like 20 other people, which was really cool. I thought people were going to forward it to like two or three people, maybe like their family or friends, just so that they could get like a free product, you know, and it ended up being that they were forwarding it to so many people and so many people were getting interested so quickly that my list just like in three months, it grew so rapidly. It was really exciting. But that whole, you know, module and start and scale, it teaches you how to, you know, create your buyer and then it teaches you how to find them and it teaches you how to you know do the, those sort of contests and stuff so that was like instrumental in, in growing my list before the launch that's really exciting so in three months you managed to go from zero to four to five hundred email subscribers is that correct yes it was amazing <laughs> at founder 99 percent of our content is free Today's episode is only made possible by our incredible student community, from our magazine subscribers to the entrepreneurs enrolling in our course programs. If you are thinking of finally starting your own business, make sure to check out the exact free training that led today's guests to where they are now. Head to founder.com slash e-commerce training or follow the link in the show notes. Wow. And how about, I'm guessing you mentioned Instagram quite a bit. How has that been in terms of marketing for you? Has that been your main channel? to um, kind of showcase your products and things like that to your audience? Yeah, I would say Instagram is my number one platform. Um, Instagram organically and then ads as well, because you can get in front of a very targeted, specific person. Um, but I can tell on through my Shopify, like where the orders come from. And it usually, I'd say 72% of people are coming from Instagram. Wow. And how's that growth been for you? And how long did it take you to get to where you are today? It took... I mean, from start to now, right? It was a really fast process in the beginning because of the Kickstarter. And then from there it leveled out. And then I had to like organically grow through like all the other platforms. And I just set small goals for myself, right? Like overnight I had 400 orders and then then I had to find other orders. Cause like once you have one zip off legging, you don't necessarily need another one right away. So I set a goal of like, all right, we're gonna make $50 every day. Then we're gonna make $100 every day. Then we're gonna make $300 every day. And if you set those small goals and then you center like your ads and um, your activity on social media based on that, then you just like don't sleep until you hit that number. <laughs> and then eventually the organics of it comes in. And I think that's a really great and tangible way to start a business as well, setting small goals, because if you set something so massive and you don't hit it, you can feel really deterred and kind of upset with the process. So that's sure. amazing. I think really great advice. From where you just mentioned before, zero to 400 orders overnight, were they solely just from your Kickstarter campaign? Because that is incredible. Yeah, they were just on the Kickstarter. So I, like I said before, I think my Kickstarter was 45 days. Um, two years ago now so maybe three years ago now so it's hard to remember but i think i said it for 45 days or two months and i hit that number in three days so it really was like overnight success and i was like oh my gosh i thought this was going to be like a 10 person 10 people would like it and i would be able to like you know create this brand but it really was success overnight just for that kickstarter portion and then once that was over it really is starting over right so um like a lot of people think that you instantly get success overnight when you like go through the program and start a business. And that's not realistic at all. Like Kickstarter can do that for you. But then when you have to get people to a website to, for them to buy on a website, it's a completely different game. So I kind of had two separate launches, you know? And I think still that's really great because people do pre-launches and soft launches now. And I kind of guess you were using Kickstarter the same way. And yeah. Correct me if I'm wrong, your goal was 6,500 and you end up reaching around 10,000? Uh-huh, yep. Wow, that's such a great feat. So I admire like commitments to you because that would be such a boost and such an inspiration for you to keep going. Yeah, for sure. 
Yeah. And from that, you mentioned how you kind of had to start again. Walk me through how you kind of restarted that launch and started from scratch, essentially. Yeah. I mean, it, it's the same process. So again, you're having to build another list. At least this time, um, Facebook has what you can call a lookalike list. So I can use those people that purchased from my Kickstarter and kind of create ads based on those people and those movements and the, their likes and wants and needs. So I had to find another audience that wasn't the Kickstarter audience that wanted to shop from a small business online. So you do the same exact thing over and over again. You um, do the ads, you do the contests, you do the social media and commenting on people that are like-minded and all, all the stuff that you're using your Twitter fingers for every day. You know what I mean? Um, and you kind of just like rebuild another list. And then when you add something else to your story, you rebuild another list. And when you add another color, you rebuild another list. So it's kind of just like the same process over and over again. A copy and paste process almost, which is, yep. which is great. Um, so how did you perform? So once you finally launched, uh, I'm guessing in a space of maybe a week or a month, what were your profits looking like? Were they similar to where you wanted to be? So it started off very slow. Um, definitely not with the second like online store launch. It wasn't an overnight success like the Kickstarter was, um, especially with like all the stress that I had to deal with, with getting like that second marketing up and running. I couldn't do two things at the same time. What I wanted to do was while my Kickstarter was finishing, start building the list for the online launch. Um, and I couldn't do that, right? So once the Kickstarter was over, I kind of had to like start all over um, from the beginning. And so it was very slow. Like I said, I set small landmarks for myself. It was like, all right, we need to get to a hundred dollars a day. So let's get a couple orders. We're gonna set up some ads. We're gonna comment on all these influencers, Facebook, Instagrams, whatever, until somebody buys something or somebody forwards it to a friend or whatever it was. So started off like the first month I was only getting a, like maybe one, two orders a day. Like that was it. Um, and then from there grew to like the $300 a day mark, which is where I wanted to be. Um, and then we got to about four, 450 a day and then COVID hit. So it kind of changed our whole scope of our business, but um, the trend was there. So I know that we'll be able to get back there once people are back in the gyms and, you know, back in the studios and back in their facilities. But um, it took about a year to get up to, to that landmark. Which is something to say the least with COVID impacting um, gyms, people going to the gyms, but at home workouts is still a really big aspect of, you know, the climate that we're in today. Does that mean you had to change your marketing in terms of how you're positioning your brand? Yeah. So, I mean, you don't need to buff leggings when you're at home. It's just a fact. Like people aren't going to spend the dollar amount to buy them. So I added a few items that were just regular, um, uh, yoga wear or workout wear without the zippers on it they didn't do that well so then we added a water bottle and then we added kind of like some custom custom water bottles like we did like a black lives matter water bottle and like you know a unity water bottle and that sort of thing um so with people trying to like stay healthy at home we kind of made up some sales with that but we just kind of had to adopt you know what i mean and now that things are starting to open um we're starting to see like some of our yoga studios buying some more stuff again and that sort of thing but it really just was like dead stop in the water but we'll get back to it and i love the optimism because it's definitely something you need after the year we've had and we're still kind of trending towards but hopefully everything will start picking up but with sure. your new marketing tactics and, and what you were just mentioning before, do you have any ideas in terms of influencers that you want to work with in the coming year? Yeah, so I've had a lot of success with micro influencers where they only have like small numbers of followers in the thousands. So 1,000, 2,000, 3,000 followers. I find that their followers are more connected to them. They trust them a little more. Um, and they're more willing to purchase from them. Some of the macro influencers that cost a lot of money or have the hundreds of thousands of followers, people are kind of um, catching on to like what they're doing and how they're making their money. So if they post about something, people are kind of skeptical, you know what I mean? But if you have somebody that has a thousand followers and they're chatting with them all the time and they're like, hey, you guys, we have, I have this really cool zip off legging that I just tried, you guys should try it. I usually see 
sales from those. I've never really seen a big surplus of sales from um, like those macro influencers. Amazing. And it's all about getting your name out there because word of mouth is one thing, but you know, having those connections and networking is incredible. Have you tried any of, I guess, the newer platforms like TikTok or um, Snapchat and things like that to help expose your brand a little bit more? Yeah, um, I've tried TikTok. I just started a TikTok for it. It's been really cool. TikTok's weird because you'll have like, I opened the Access Athletics TikTok and like one of the first couple of videos got like 20,000 views and then some will get like 20 and you're like, but I did the same thing. <laughs> like what's happening? So it takes a while to kind of build an audience there as well. But I think as many platforms as you can get on and as many people as you can touch and as much time as you have in your life to create all those videos and stuff that you should do it right because the world is changing people's attention spans are getting shorter so they're always going to want the next best thing the next best platform and if you can stick with the times i think that just adds to the success of what your your business can be in the future and i fully fully I fully 100% agree with that because it's so true. Everything changes. Everything does have a lifespan. So if as a business you're willing to evolve and keep changing, um, I guess, your marketing tactics, I think, yeah, you can only keep growing. And like you mentioned, the algorithms can play in your favor and also be a little bit funny. Yeah, they change so often. I just started focusing on um, Pinterest. Pinterest is like the new thing now. So um, that's new to me. I've been like, figuring out that algorithm and how people connect there, but it's definitely an untapped um, marketplace that, that has been like really great for some people. So I'm trying to figure that out now and see how that can help. I'd love to hear more. So are you just pinning your photos from, I guess, photo shoots or what sort of things are you pinning on Pinterest? Yeah. So Pinterest is, is interesting. You can link, they just started doing, um, it's called, what do they call it? Pinterest story or Pinterest video or something like that. So you can actually pin to a video. So I can pin to a TikTok or I can pin to an Instagram video or I can pin to a YouTube um, or I can pin to a blog. Like if I write a blog about, you know, five things to do to stay healthy at home and I pin to that and within that blog is a link to buy a pair of leggings, then you can like kind of link your business through all these different marketplaces and it just allows you to get that many more touches on you know different parties that's really interesting and i think people listening yeah. might even take that advice and go look at pinterest because it is an older platform but it's definitely getting some of the newer updates which like you mentioned is making it yeah. so accessible it's pretty unbelievable because i usually only use pinterest for like recipes right or like diys at home but what you can do now for your business i would recommend people starting to dig into it it's really cool the changes that they've made great advice I guess let's go back a little bit because we were talking about your designs and I did notice that you mentioned you said you have a few different designs and a few different products. How many, I guess, different iterations of your leggings and your tops do you have now in compared to some of your other accessories? Not a lot, right? So I have one main one that's just like an all black um, outfit, black leggings, black sports bra, and then I have a leopard print and two other colors. And then outside of that, I have let's call it four or five different just regular sets of athletic wear. And that was added during the whole COVID phase. But I'll, I'll definitely phase out. We were only doing that to adapt, but I want to stay specific and like straight for the zip off line. Uh, but we needed something for people that were still working out at home. And then uh, the water bottles. Amazing. And what's next in terms of you this year and designing? Are you doing on trend designs, are you kind of trying to create something new, doing shorts? What's next? I think we'll stay, I'm really into block colors. So I like just like a straight up, like all black outfit, you know, all green outfit or you know what I mean? I like that because then people can mix and match it and you don't have to um, shun anybody that is like colorful or not, or you know, everybody can like mix and match and pick something that'll go with anything that they have in their closet. So it keeps it easy. Definitely. I'm such a person for block color, so I can definitely agree with you on that one. Yeah. And mixing and matching makes it 10 times easier as well. So I think that's a great idea. Yeah, <laughs> thank you. You're very welcome. And in terms of, you mentioned what's next, 
working towards wrapping up, what would you say to someone if they're listening to this thinking, I have this idea, I really want to execute it. What would be some solid advice that you would like to share with anyone? Sure. Um, I get that question a lot because especially being featured on like the first testimonial for start and scale, people DM me and email me and Facebook me all the time asking for advice. And the number one thing I tell people is literally just start because they want to figure out everything before they get going. They want the name, they want to buy the website, they want to, you know, get a logo, they want to do everything. And then it ends up like a year later or two years later. And I'm like, well, what, what happened? Like you said, you had this great idea and, and they just were overwhelmed and just didn't start. Right. So put your foot out there, open the door, push yourself out and just get started. That's it. I think that's really great advice and something that everyone can kind of adapt to their own situation, whether it's a physical product, a service or anything else along those lines. You mentioned how we spoke two years ago, which is crazy. What's the most significant change that's happened with you and Access Athletics in two years since we last spoke? Um, yeah, I guess I would say that my I initially designed for people that do hot yoga. That was like who I was thinking of, that's who I made it for. And through the Kickstarter process, I realized that there was a whole different world that I'd never even thought of that was interested or that needed the product. And so somehow um, ice skaters have gotten like a hold of my product and who would have thought that it would have been so difficult to take off your sweats and your ice skates and you have to like unlace your skates and put them back on. And, and so like, I get a lot of orders from Russia. It's very interesting. So branching out and like opening my own mind and saying like, okay, this is not designed for yoga. It's designed for people who have a hard time taking off warmups. I had to change my mind. And once I did that, it really opened up the scope of my business. Um, so that was like a really significant change. Once I started seeing like where they were going, now I can start targeting to people that are ice skaters. You know what I mean? So it just is like remembering not to be closed minded. And once you realize that your business can go above and beyond without even knowing you it can, you'll really expand. <laughs> that must have been so exciting to experience because obviously in the figure skating and ice skating world, there's the Olympics, there's much bigger opportunities that can come from having those sort of connections, it kind of leaves the door open to you to kind of rethink your strategies. And like you mentioned to you actually want to market to, are you starting to yeah. put those ads in place to kind of get a new audience in different niches? Yeah, I was in the beginning. Um, once we kind of slowed down with COVID, I kind of stopped with all of the ads and marketing. And I think I want to bring someone on that is in that realm that can help me cater specifically to those people. Cause I don't know anything about ice skating. I don't know anything about like the mud runners or like what they go through um, when they're buying them. So I want to try to like pull people from each of those worlds so I can have a better insight of what their needs are. And then I can change the design a little bit to make it better for them, you know? Um, and once that happens, I think that it'll set me on a, wider scale. <laughs> it sounds like you have a lot coming in your future with your brand and this new brand that you were kind of mentioning too, how you're using the start and, start and scale method to help with that as well, which I think is very exciting. So who knows, another two years, we could be catching up again and talking about this other brand. <laughs> Let's do it. So lastly, I do want to thank you for sitting down and talking to me, but where is your life now? Could you have imagined that from starting this business and starting that one sample in your living room from sewing that you've learned from a family generation that you'd be where you are today? Absolutely not. And, and to answer where is my life now, like it's just free, right? Like especially coming from the corporate world, everybody dreams of like owning their own business and doing their own thing and being on their schedule or their own schedule and let me just get this out now. Owning your own business does not like give you a lot of free time. It makes you a lot busier, but when you're doing something that you love and you have your hands in it and you get to do whatever you say, it's just a different world. It's a different life. It's a happier life. And um, when you feel successful, things just like taste better. <laughs> you know great yeah for sure and I'm sure a lot of people listening can agree with that too thinking about how they want to escape the nine to five but if you do something you're passionate about they say it's like you never work a day in your life so thank you so much for taking the time sitting down and speaking with me today Jennifer and I hope that we can catch up again in another two years or if not sooner and speak about more of your successes
I would love that. Thank you guys so much. Hey guys, we hope you're loving From Zero to Founder and you're getting a ton of value from it. If you want access to the exact free training that led today's founder to where they are now, head to founder.com slash e-commerce training or follow the link in the show notes.